Okay, so moving into Unit 4, Social and Behavioral Sciences and Public Health. You might be relieved to know that I'm not going to actually ask you to read the entire chapter uh, this time because it gets into some things that we just don't really have time to do justice to, but I highly recommend that you read them in your spare time if you have any. But we're going to focus on kind of the following. So how social systems relate to health, the impact of socioeconomic status, culture and religion on health, the social determinants of health, and then a little bit we're gonna talk about behavior change and what makes things easy to change versus difficult to change, some of the theories and models and some of the tips and tricks that we can use to try to encourage more healthy behaviors. So let's just talk about social systems and what we mean when we're talking about social systems. So there's kind of three different levels. Think of them almost as concentric circles, although that becomes imperfect for reasons that will be clear. So at the individual level, you have the choices that you make as an individual, which are based on your knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs, which are things that you in part get from how you were raised, the things to which you were exposed, your culture, your religion, your family of origin, your neighbors, all those things, but then also kind of your intrinsic personality and your own nature. So there's the individual factors, and then there are your social and community networks. So so within that category, we have interpersonal things. So that's family and friends, people with whom you have individual relationships, um, social and familial for the most part. Then you have institutional or organizational. So you are all part of the UW Stout community. So you are also part of the Menominee community. You are also perhaps part of the athletics community. We're all parts of different organizations and different communities. You might be part of a particular faith community that are going to have influences on our behavior. Then, of course, there's kind of the broader community-wide. We're all Wisconsinites, or maybe you're a Minnesotan, right? So but we're all Americans, probably, unless you're an international student, right? So we have all these different communities of which we are a part. And then all of this is situated in the general socioeconomic, cultural, and environmental conditions, which, as I have already alluded to several times in the course thus far, are really powerful at determining your health, right? So when we talk about those health determinants, they're very strong. So our social systems are going to influence behavior in several ways. One is that they're going to shape norms, like what's the expected way to behave in any given situation? What are the things that we just do because that's what we do because of who we are? Um, so for example, uh, here at Stout, we wear masks and that's just what we do. Now, interestingly, we also enforce that, right? So it's a rule here at South that you have to wear a mask while you're on campus currently and probably for the near future as well. Um, so that's also enforced, right? There can be sanctions and disciplinary consequences if you don't comply with that uh, rule or mandate, if you wanna use that term, which has become loaded. Um, but you can also provide support for healthy behaviors and the campus tries to do that. So you have access to counseling. They made gym memberships and fitness classes free during the pandemic to try to encourage people to be healthy in as many ways as possible. Um, encouraging healthy coping strategies, having kind of stress reduction nights. I walked by a gingerbread making activity stress relief event during finals week. There are lots of different things that social systems can do. And here I'm just talking about the Stout community, but um, all the different communities of which you're a part. There are many things that they can do that kind of influence behavior. So um, I mentioned a few of those, and mass, of course, is actually a rule, but Interestingly, we also, through a series of incentives and disincentives for not getting vaccinated, uh, we have a really high vaccination rate on our campus. It's in large part due to those things. It's also in large part due to the education level of the people who are members of the Stout community. And what's interesting is that the vaccination rate among Stout students and employees is significantly different than the general vaccination rate in Dunn County. So as you can see, only 46% of Dunn County residents are fully vaccinated. So at Stout, 
we have twice as high a vaccination rate. Um, it's a different social system. There's a different norm here. This is just more of what we do. Okay, so uh, really, really powerful. When we look at different um, categories or characteristics of individuals, uh, socioeconomic status ends up being actually a really powerful predictor of someone's overall health and wellness. So when we talk about socioeconomic status, we're referring to basically three variables combined. Your income level, right? So how much money you have, your education level, which is different, although they're often related, but different, and then your professional status. So how much status and social standing do you have in your community, um, at your workplace, uh, which gives you kind of a sense of agency and a sense of self-respect and lots of other things. And so what we see is that there's a direct correlation. The higher your socioeconomic status is, the higher your life experience expectancy is. So I'm just going to show you a couple of charts looking at different aspects here. So this was a really interesting study where they looked at your life expectancy, so the, your likelihood of making it to age 85, which is higher than average life expectancy, your likelihood of making it to age 85 based on your income quintile. So quintile number one is the people who are at the lowest quintile, the lowest you know, 20% of population that were in the lowest income, and then quintile five is, is the richest people, right? So the 20% the of the population that is richer than everybody else. And what you see is this huge impact, right? So if you're in the, the lowest income quintile, you only have about a 26% chance of making it to age 85. But if you're in the fourth or fifth, you have a 65% chance of making it to age 85. What I thought was really interesting about this particular study is they compared this to a historical cohort. So you see these two cohorts. So these were people who were born in 1930 versus people who were born in 1960. Um, so they're looking at the impact of, so, of income, particularly in this study, on life expectancy. And what you can see is that over time, this has changed markedly. So while the poorest 20% historically only had about a 26 to 27% likelihood of making it to age 85, you can see it used to be that the richest 20% only had a 45% chance. But now, or, you know, because the 1960 people are like 85 now, right, just about now you have a 66% chance. So what we've seen is that increase in life expectancy that has happened in the United States is primarily just for people who are wealthier, <laughs> that people who are poor are not really doing any better than they ever did historically. Um, so that's something we really need to think about. This is a graph that looks at your life expectancy based on education. So whether you have a degree in this particular study, it was whether you had a master's degree or you did not, or excuse me, a bachelor's degree. So whether you went to college, you did your four years like you're doing here at Stout, uh, whether you had a bachelor's degree or whether you did not. And you can see people with a bachelor's degree on average life expectancy in 2018 was about 84, whereas people who did not, it was about 77. That's a difference of seven years. That's huge, right? It's an enormous difference and it's kind of widened over time. So this is this difference is getting worse. It's getting amplified. The the more educated, wealthier people are benefiting, whereas the less educated, less wealthy people are not from advances that we've had in health. I like this chart because it shows you how big of an impact low socioeconomic status actually has on life expectancy, comparing it to other types of kind of health behaviors. So those kind of individual choices that we may or may not make. So smoking far and away is one of the biggest things that you can do to put yourself in an early grave. You can see it's going to take almost five years off of your life expectancy on average. And then we see diabetes and we see physical inactivity. So some of you got some feedback from me on some of your earlier essays that being physically active is one of the most important things you can do for your health overall. Um, but you can see that having low socioeconomic status is just as bad as 
not exercising. And as you can see, it's far worse than being of a large body size. So if you look at obesity, for all the press and all the talk we do about obesity and what a problem it is, you can see that obesity is actually much less of a problem than low socioeconomic status or physical inactivity. Now, some of you hopefully are sitting there saying, yeah, yeah, Dr. Hall, but what about your health adjusted life expectancy, right? It's not just about how long you live, but about how well you live. Well, I'm so glad you asked. This is a lovely study that was looking at the relationship, obviously, between this one was looking at education level and your health adjusted life expectancy and your overall life expectancy. So what we're seeing in the blue, so let's see, whoops, ooh, I didn't know where I was. So over here, the blue bars, that's healthy, right? So that's your H-A-L-E, your health adjusted life expectancy. And then in red, it takes you all the way to the, your total life expectancy. So those are the years that you would live in less than ideal health or less than good health. And so what we see is if you only went through primary school, you only have about 50 years of health adjusted life expectancy, and then you're gonna have 20 to 30 years of poor health, right? So you're still gonna make it to age 80, but you're much less likely to have good healthy years or to have as many good healthy years. So higher secondary means you've graduated college, um, or excuse me, high school. Higher education means you've gone to college. So you can see people who go to college on average, their health adjusted life expectancy is over 70. So they're in good health. They're, they're living well up into their early 70s. Um, whereas again, look at for those folks that weren't able to finish, you know, kind of through eighth grade, only up to maybe about age 50. So huge differences, even bigger differences in health adjusted life expectancy than in overall life expectancy. So the impact here of education, uh, particularly, but we see that for socioeconomic status generally as well. Not only is your individual socioeconomic status really important in determining your life expectancy and health adjusted life expectancy, but also the degree of inequality that exists in your society. So there's this measure called the Gini index or coefficient, and it's a measure of how unequal the distribution of wealth is in any particular society. So here in the United States, we have some ridiculously wealthy people, and then we also have a lot of really impoverished people. So we have a lot of inequality in our country. So you can see we're kind of that greenish teal range. So we're in the 40s. Higher is more unequal on this. So we are a much more unequal uh, society than Canada and all of Europe basically, and, and most countries in the world. We, ha we have more inequality than many places, uh, but less than some others, right? You can look at Brazil there and some countries in Southern Africa are quite unequal. So what's interesting is that your health, even if you personally are of high socioeconomic status, your health is worse if you live in a country with high inequality. So let's take a look at a study. So what we're looking at here is that the respondents rated their self-reported good health. So over here on the y-axis is the probability that they will report, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty healthy. I'm in overall pretty good health. My life is good. I'm able to function well. So we can see that in countries with the Gini index of, you know, 0. 0.4, 40%, so it gets used differently, that everybody's pretty close. And so these different lines, you can see these different, here's one, here's one, right? These different lines are according to your education status. So the higher ones are higher educated people, the lower ones are lower educated people. And you can see everyone's clustered pretty closely together. And 70 to 80% of people report that, they, yeah, they're in good health. And what we can see is that as that inequality gets higher, the rate of self-reported good health goes down. And it goes down not just for the people with lower socioeconomic status, lower education, it goes down for everyone. And we, then they start to spread out, right? So the people with the lowest socioeconomic status are the most impacted. But 
you know, so you end up down here in a highly unequal country at only a 60% chance of seeing you're in good health. Even the most well-off, most well-educated people have gone down from about an 80% chance of reporting good health to about a 72% chance of good health. So isn't that interesting that it's not only your personal situation, but also the situation of the people around you and that inequality that has an impact on your overall health. All right, we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about culture. First of all, what is it? Well, we've all kind of been raised on kind of the what Margaret Cho calls the food festivals and fun model of culture, like, oh, we eat these foods and we celebrate these holidays and let's do this game. Um, but actually, a culture is your way of looking at the world and making meaning out of it and deciding how to judge different things and make decisions. So it's kind of a framework, a lens, or a perspective through which you view the world. And I know that sounds kind of nebulous, um, but it is, but it helps us make judgments about the world and decisions about behavior. So um, having lived in multiple different parts of the country, I can tell you even within the United States, we have very different cultures from one region to another. One of the things I love about living in Wisconsin is that we tend to be very friendly and open and chatty with each other, which is lovely most of the time. But when I first ever moved to Wisconsin, I just couldn't stand how long it took me to get through the grocery store and through the checkout because everybody kept talking to me and I really just wanted to go in and get some milk and be on my way, but everybody kept chatting me up and I was frustrated because I wasn't used to it. It's a different culture. So there's some really good media assignments today about culture and how they, uh, form the way you interact with the world and what you see as appropriate behavior and inappropriate behavior. So your culture then, and we all have lots of different influences on our culture. So we're Americans, we're Wisconsinites or Minnesotans or something else, um, but we all have lots of different cultural uh, groups to which we belong. But it's going to directly impact many of your daily health habits and choices. So what foods you eat? Do you consume alcohol? If so, how much? Do you use tobacco? Do you vape? What types of sexual behaviors do you engage in or not? Also, what types of activities do you do? Are you very physically active? Do you play a lot of sports? Um, or you're, are you a gamer, perhaps, who you know is part of that culture and doesn't actually do a lot of physical activity? Yes, I'm making an assumption there. It's true about the group as a whole, um, but any individual could be different for sure. It's also going to directly impact how you respond to situations. Um, so to give a non-health related example, I was recently in Florida out on a boat in the Charlotte Harbor and we're going by and we see other people on their boats and I'm waving hello I'm doing the Wisconsin boat wave right that's what we do we're on a boat life is good we wave hello to everybody and all these Floridians and probably people who are visiting from other states too would just kind of look at me and then uh, right they totally didn't get the boat wave right so um it's a different culture so how you respond to situations is going to be different how you respond to an illness is going to be different do you just if you cut yourself do you just put some duct tape over it or do you go to the emergency room or do you wait and then go to your doctor the next day a lot of these things are culturally dictated um, in terms of how we respond to different things both health related and otherwise so, you know, we see a lot of differences um, by regional culture. So, for example, in Wisconsin, we are known as a place where alcohol is consumed quite regularly. It has been very fascinating for me, having lived in New York State, both upstate New York and New York City for much of my life, as well as Vermont and other places, to move here to Wisconsin and see how much a part of daily life alcohol is for many people. And what's interesting is that although the previous graph didn't look too bad, if you look at the number of people that engage in heavy drinking in Wisconsin, that's where we really stand out. So there are a lot of heavy drinkers in Wisconsin, um, and that absolutely negatively impacts the health of our population. Religion, of course, is going to have an influence on your health behaviors and your health overall.
There are going to be rules in many religions about what foods you can and cannot eat, about alcohol. Sometimes some religions have rules about tobacco. Certainly most religions have rules about sexual behaviors uh, that you may or may not follow, but they help form kind of your knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs about how you should behave. Some religions also have some traditional healing practices. So you might be thinking about some Native American practices. Uh, or, you know, thinking of voodoo or, or something kind of unusual like that. But even within kind of more familiar religions, many Christian religions believe in prayer healing and faith healing and those types of things. So that's going to have an impact. And then there are also sometimes rules about what is acceptable for medical or health care. So the Church of Christian Science, for example, is pretty famous for issuing medical interventions, right? You don't go to the hospital, you don't go to the doctor in general. Jehovah's Witness, interestingly, they have um, a, an edict against receiving blood transfusions. And this can sometimes be really tricky, especially if it's a child who might die without one. And the parents are saying, well, no, you can't because that's a sin. It's, it's, it's forbidden in our religion. Um, and I once had a patient who was Jehovah's Witness who needed open heart surgery. Um, and that's a surgery where usually you end up needing some transfusions. It's a pretty big deal. And so they had to do all kinds of special things to try to make it so she could come through that surgery successfully without needing a transfusion. Uh, so religion definitely can have an impact on your behavior, but also on how you interact with the medical system. Okay, so all together, we've kind of been dancing around this issue, but when it comes down to the categories of things that are important for an individual and determining their health kind of from a social aspect, we're going to call those the social determinants of health. So remember when we talked about determinants of health way back when, and we talked about all those environmental things um, and things in your social environment, your total ecology, and then we talked about your personal biology, your health behaviors, and your access to medical care. And then the um, textbook talked about the big gems framework, right? So behaviors, infections, genetics, geography, environment, medical care, and it was social status or something, social environment, right? Uh, so different ways of talking about the same things. But so your social status is actually really important. That's part of that socioeconomic status. And so that's something that we wanna assess when we're dealing with an individual. It also tells us how much agency and control you have over your life and, um, and how much power you have, um, which if you're completely powerless over your life, then it's gonna be much harder for you to have good health. Social support versus alienation. So do you have people whom you care about who care about you? We are social creatures, and that makes a huge difference in the health of human beings. Food, you need enough of it, and it needs to be nutritious, and it needs to be safe, and it needs to not be too much and, um, and not too contaminated in, in any particular way. Uh, housing, you need to have shelter, and it needs to be clean and uh, warm, uh, especially in January in Wisconsin. And uh, yeah, super important. Education, we've already seen how important a predictor that is for your overall health. Work, so what is your work situation? Is it satisfying? Is it gratifying? Is it really stressful? Is it really making you miserable? Is it giving you high blood pressure and stomach ulcers? Or is it pleasurable and it makes you feel like you're productive and that your life has meaning? Is it giving you enough income to survive, right? And is it safe? Or are you working in a coal mine, right? Are you working in a potentially dangerous occupation? Are you a police officer or a firefighter who's not um, who's exposed to a lot of environmental hazards on the job. So your work is really important. Stress is huge. Uh, stress of any kind is really huge. And this is where we also see the impact of being a persecuted minority. If you're part of a group that is often discriminated against, uh, then that stress is going to show up and it's going to have a big influence on your health. Um, same thing if, if you can't meet your basic physical needs, that is a stress as well, of course. 
Transportation is interesting. So if you live in a place where it's easy for you to walk or bike to the store, to your work, those types of things, that's going to encourage much healthier behaviors and that's going to help promote your health. Whereas if you live in a place where you're in your car all the time or you're in your car for many hours a day uh, eating fast food to and from work, uh, then you're going to have a lower health. But also transportation in terms of your ability to get to places when you need to. So for example, the VA medical system for our veterans in this country, if they do not have transportation to get to an appointment, the VA will send out a van and get them there, right? So if they can't drive, they don't have a car, they will get you there because transportation is necessary as anyone who has had their car breakdown is very aware. Place. Right? So are you living in a place with clean air and clean water? Are you living in a place where there's a lot of COVID-19? Are you living in a place where there's a lot of malaria? Are you living in a place where there's a lot of violence and interpersonal conflict? Are you living in a war zone? Right. So ge that geography piece is huge. And then access to health services. So not only, um, and this is more about having access to health services, not necessarily the quality of the medical care you will get, Again, you can see that all of this right, is hugely important. And all of these things, you know, one through 10, these are the things that your doctor can't do for you, right? These are the things that are totally outside the, the health system's control. These are things that are societal issues. Um, and certainly you have some personal agency and choice with many of these, but you're also gonna be impacted to a significant extent by your environment and your circumstances. It's not all within your control. All right, so moving on, let's kind of talk about those health behaviors. We've been talking about all the things that influence health behaviors in terms of culture and religion and, and those things and that influence your health outcomes in terms of socioeconomic status. Um, but what do we know about health behaviors and can they be changed? So they can be changed some of the time. <laughs> and they have. People now routinely wear seat belts. Most people do most of the time. Anyhow, that was not the case when I was younger. So things do change. People are much less likely to smoke cigarettes nowadays than they were when I was young as a result of lots of different types of public health interventions and policy and laws and all types of things. So health behaviors can be changed. It's not always easy. Um, it's easiest if it's a simple substitute and there's a big payoff. So if, um, you know, for example, sometimes if somebody wants to quit smoking, they might start chewing gum instead, right? They're going to substitute one behavior for another. Um, and then if there's a big payoff, if you get a huge reward, especially in the near term, that's going to really incentivize that behavior. So offering $100 to get vaccinated against COVID, well, that was a big payoff. So things like that can make health behaviors easier. There are things that help our knowledge, helping people understand the importance of the behavior and why it's a good idea for them. Incentives, like I mentioned, <laughs> the payoff. Um, if it's low cost, available, accessible, and easy to use. So those all fall under the category of making it easy. Making it easy for people to do the right thing is actually huge. We tend to think, oh, I would do the right thing no matter what, because it's the right thing. But we're humans and humans in general are lazy. And so the easier you make it for somebody to choose the right thing, the more likely they are to do it. That's why at Student Health Services, you can get condoms really inexpensively, right? It's, you know, you don't have to worry about your friend running into you at the CVS cash register, looking at what you're buying. Um, it's much less expensive that way. Um, it's why a lot of times in the dorms, they'll have condoms for free, just trying to make it easier for people to make a healthier choice. It can be really difficult to change behaviors if it's a change to their physiology, so a real big change in how their body is functioning, or if it has to do with addiction. So those are really, really, really tough things to change. Often too, um, it's difficult to change behaviors if they are pleasurable behaviors. So eating, drinking, sex, those types of things also tend to be difficult to change. 
Here's a couple of examples of how difficult it is uh, to change your physiology and how difficult it is to overcome addiction. So this graphic on the left that shows you kind of all the people, this was a study looking or at electronic health records. So of people who were engaging in healthcare systems, so they were seeing the doctor with some regularity for whatever health issue, and by their weight, they qualified as obese according to the formula that is used. And so they said, okay, of these patients, how many of them ever lose 5% or more of their body weight? And those are the people in purple. And what we find when we ask people if they're trying to lose weight is among people who are obese, usually 50% of them say that they are, right? So 50% of these people are trying to, right? But only 10% were actually successful. So maybe 20% of people were successful. If we look at who's able to keep the weight off, the numbers are even lower. So what we find in general is about 10% of people are able to be successful at losing weight and keeping it off. And they are the most motivated and um, almost obsessive um, of, of the folks. It's very difficult to do. So, so that's something that's really difficult. Addiction treatment is also, it's really difficult to recover from an addiction. So, you know, this is an interesting graphic because they're talking about how um, a lot of people in the therapeutic community will say 30% of people can kick their addiction and they can recover from addiction, which you might be like, well, gosh, that's pretty low actually and that is really low um uh less than half of people seem to be able to get better but when you look more closely it's even worse than that actually so that 30 percent success rate is based off of the people who complete a treatment program and normally only 20 to 30 percent of people who enter a treatment program complete it so only one third of the 20 to 30 percent so at best 10 percent of people with addiction are successful at recovering from that addiction and staying clean this stuff is super super hard okay <laughs> So what are the things that are going to support change? So obviously individual motivation and determination is important, right? But we need to acknowledge that that alone is not enough. Even the most motivated and disciplined person is often not going to be successful, especially if it's a more difficult thing to change, without encouragement and support from the groups around them. So groups of people around them, whether it be a support group, whether it be their family, whether it be their friends, their spouse, what have you and with broader support from their society and their community in terms of social policies and expectations. And if you're ever unsure of how powerful those social expectations are, I highly encourage you to try going somewhere in town where people don't usually wear face masks, like Lucette or Quick Trip, and go there with your face mask on and try to stay there for 15 minutes and see how it feels. It doesn't feel good. No, it doesn't. All right. So all of these things are necessary to help support change. So in the book, it then goes into theories and models of health behavior change. And there are different levels at which these models uh, operate. So intrapersonal is things that are intra means within. So within your own person. So those are things that are just unique and contained within yourself. And so there's three, the health belief model, the stages of change, and the theories of theory of planned behavior. I'm not going to ask you about those, but if you're interested, I encourage you to read up on them. Stages of change is one that we use a lot in healthcare um, to identify where someone is at and if they are wanting to change their behavior or if they're thinking about it or planning to do it or they're in the process so that we tailor our interventions and meet them where they're at because otherwise we can just really just turn them off and um and then they never come back 
Interpersonal is how you kind of relate to the people and the world around you. So that's where social cognitive theory comes in. And then at the population and community level, there is this diffusion of innovation theory and model that looks at the people who are like kind of the pioneers, the early adopters, then the, the next crew or kind of the change leaders that really kind of say, yeah, yeah, this is a thing. And they get other people to come along with them. And then there's the laggards, right? So the people who hold back the longest. Um, so thinking about how to target your messages to those different groups of people. The only thing from the book that I'm going to kind of point out to you is I liked this, um, some things from behavioral economics. So what things seem to be really helpful? And you can think of these as life hacks, right? How can you hack your own psychology to make it more likely that you'll be successful at instituting a change? So I'm just going to quickly go through these. So losses loom larger than gains. So what's interesting is that, you know, if it's a weight loss program or a smoking sensation program, patients are going to be more um, able to adhere to the program and stick with it if they have to pay if they don't. So um, I know there's this weight loss, but was it tips or something? And like if you didn't go to the, your exercise program, you had to pay money, right? So there was a penalty that you had to pay. Um, and so that tends to work. People don't want to have to pay a fine. Um, just in time reminders, some of you maybe already use those. If you're someone who takes birth control pills, you might use an app on your phone that helps remind you, okay, it's time to take your pill, for example. Those can work uh, really well in lots of different types of uh, situations. And I cut off part of the rest of that paragraph, sorry to say that. And then the other is that making things easy. So the default choices are usually retained. So just like when you get a new phone, a lot of the settings that come as default, you just leave them that way because it's just easier, right? So you just kind of do that. And we have a lot of evidence that that's true across all different types of behaviors. So for example, when I write a prescription now, the default is that the pharmacy will substitute in the generic unless I specify otherwise. Because in the vast majority of cases, the generic is just as good and way less expensive, so it saves our whole healthcare system money, saves the patient money, and it works just as well. Um, I have to go out of my way to say, no, I only want the patient to get the brand name prescription. And that works really, really well. We're also more influenced by our colleagues and peers than by data and evidence. And um, we see this in spades with a lot of the COVID mitigation measures. Um, you can show someone data till the cows come home, but they're going to most likely do the things that the people in their social group are doing um, because we are social animals. Um, even among physicians who in general tend to be pretty rational decision makers, again, you're more likely to change your practice. Um, let's say a new guideline comes out if the other people around you are doing it than if you're presented with a table about how important it is. And then creating new habits is key to behavioral change. So establishing new habits, right? Making something a habit, making it part of your regular routine is hugely important. And taking out that question of, should I go to the gym or should I not go to the gym? Do I feel like going to the gym or do I not feel like going to the gym? No, it's Monday morning at 8 o'clock, I go to the gym because that's what I do. On Monday mornings at 8 o'clock, I go to the gym. Now you're looking at me like I'm crazy. Okay, maybe 11 a.m. I don't know, depending on your particular schedule. So these are just some, some life hacks and things that can be really helpful motivators to change human behaviors. So overall for this unit, what I want you to, to know about is how social systems relate to health, the impact of socioeconomic status, both at the individual level and in terms of the inequality present in your society, culture and religion, and then those social determinants of health. So there's going to be a lot of media assignments this week um, helping you delve into that a little bit more. And then a little bit about behavior change and what makes it easy to change a behavior, what makes it harder to change a behavior, and just knowing that there's a lot of different models out there. Uh, a lot of behavioral psychology goes into trying to figure out how best to help people make choices that are healthier for them. All right, everyone, thank you, and I'll see you for Unit 5 next.